And of course, when he started his study, this big study I found in The Lancet over 34 years, that was 1949 and randomised control trials didn't exist. And I think, in fact, if he'd been publishing his study in 1949 instead of in 1990, I mean, he needed to take the 34 years to do the study and then write it up and so on. If he'd published it back in 49, I think he would have, would have won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Um, the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1934 went to an American physician, George Minow, who um, gave a chopped liver diet to people with pernicious anemia. And they didn't die anymore. It wasn't a randomised controlled trial. He didn't randomly give half the group liver and the other half the group no liver. He just gave 44 people with pernicious anemia liver uh, and they stopped dying. This was a, a death sentence in those days. He won the Nobel Prize in medicine. He was the first North American to win it. I think if Swank had published in 1949, there would have been very few contenders with him to win the Nobel Prize. But many of you will have heard your doctor say, ah, oh, Swank's study, that's not evidence. It's, um, it's extraordinary to think that it would be viewed that way. This is probably one of the most decorated professors in neurology that has um, been on planet Earth. Uh, when you look at his paper, it's quite extraordinary. He started with 150 people in, uh, from his MS clinics, and he had two neurologists confirm the diagnosis of MS before they went in. Of course, MRI machines didn't exist, so we can, we can criticise and say they didn't get MRIs. Well, gosh, if Swank had also invented MRIs, and also invented the randomised control trial format, as well as devised what is probably a life-saving diet for MS. They should have won three Nobel Prizes. Um, but in any event, they were enrolled in the study, and Swank had done a lot of work, um, and I retraced his footsteps fairly recently in Norway um, in, a couple of weeks ago, and he was looking at people in the coastal villages of Norway who ate a mainly fish diet, and those in the inland parts of Norway who ate a mainly meat and dairy diet at the time he did his groundwork for this study. And he found there was a six-fold higher incidence in those who ate meat and dairy in the inland parts of Norway. And he was smart enough to say, well, I'll try that out now in a number of countries. And he looked at the, the meat and dairy consumption in a number of countries and compared it to the countries that had high fish consumption and found there was a dramatic difference in MS in those countries and then devised a diet that was very low in saturated fat. So he told people they should reduce their saturated fat consumption below 20 grams a day. Now that's four teaspoons of butter. Um, you probably get, well, you, you get about, about 50 grams in a McDonald's burger. So it, you had to reduce it a fair bit. Um, and the average American at that time was eating between 100 and 125 grams of saturated fat per day. So he kept meticulous food diaries on these people. They had to come in every two weeks for the first six months. They analysed everything they'd eat and he had a team of people working to work out exactly what saturated fat consumption they had. Once they got good at it, they were able to keep their own diaries. <clears throat> and then he followed them up over the extraordinary period of 34 years and only six people dropped out of the study over that time. Now I've done a fair bit of research. I've never had a dropout rate as low as 4%. And mine usually lasts a year uh, or two at the most. This is a 34-year study. So this guy was meticulous in how we ran this study. But then to find that if you ate 15 grams of saturated fat per day, the death rate from MS was 25% all those years later. If you ate 25 grams per day, so still one-sixth of what the average American was having, one-fifth, your death rate was 75% from MS. To find the people who didn't stick to this diet, who actually reduced their saturated fat consumption down to 38 grams a day, so about a third of, of what they had been eating, big reduction, didn't affect them at all. It didn't give them any benefit. These people were dead or disabled and bedbound. Only two were still active. The people who were good dieters, who stayed under the 20 grams, who averaged 16 grams a day, um, were mostly reasonably fit at the end of 34 years. Mostly actually still ambulating normally, walking around. Many of them still at work even, 
in their 70s. Now, the interesting thing about it too was that whatever level of disability people entered his study at, if they were good dieters, they didn't deteriorate much. They stayed pretty much at that level for the 34 years. Now, this is really important for people who have got quite a bit of disability because it's one thing to have quite a bit of disability, but it's another to get more, to get more disabled and to end up, as my mother did, being unable to brush your own teeth and do your own hair and, and feed yourself. Um, it's important to know that it's with just that intervention there's the potential to stabilise this illness even with quite advanced disease. Now we've done quite a bit of work since Swank's um, paper. A lot's changed since he started that diet obviously in 1949 and our recommended um, nutritional approach is superior to Swank's because it's taken account of what research has, has come since. And most particularly that a number of papers have now reported a, a significant issue with dairy products and people with MS. So we've removed dairy products from the diet. Swank didn't. He suggested people have low fat dairy. Um, we've also removed all meat from the diet so that it's now a plant-based whole food diet, so as unrefined as you can get it, plus seafood. And the seafood part of it is unlimited. We know that the oils in seafood are very healthy oils. 